now call this meeting to order. And if you can please uh, write this to the to the council of New York for your petition, be followed by the pledge of the Thank you, Mayor. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce tonight Father Matthew Schiffelbein. Father Matt is the pastor of Christ the King Catholic Church here in Topeka. He's a native of Topeka and alumnus of Washburn University and the University of Kansas. Father Matthew was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Kansas City in Kansas in May of 2009. After serving at parishes in Overland Park, Garnett, and Greeley, he was named pastor of Christ the King in Topeka in July 2016. And Father Matthew is my pastor, so welcome, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you, Mayor De La Isla, City Council, for the invitation to join you here this evening and lead this invocation. So you can pray with me in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed are you, Lord God of mercy, who through your Son gave us a marvelous example of charity and the great commandment of love for one another. Send down your blessings on me as your servants, who so generously devote themselves to the service of our community. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, conscious of our sinfulness, but aware that we gather in your name. Come to us, remain with us, and enlighten our hearts. Give us light and strength to know your will, to make it our own, and to live it in our lives. Guide us by your wisdom. Support us by your power. For you are God, sharing the glory of the Father and the Son. You desire justice for all. Help us to uphold the rights of others. Do not allow us to be misled by ignorance or corrupted by fear or favor. Unite us to yourself in the bond of charity and keep us faithful to all that is true as we gather in your name. May we temper justice with mercy so that all our decisions may be pleasing to you and earn the reward promised to good and faithful servants who live with the Father and the Son, one God forever and ever. Amen. May all God bless all those gathered here and all these proceedings, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We now proceed to the roll call. Mayor De La Isla. Here. Council members Hiller. Here. Valdivia Acla. Here. Ortiz. Here. Emerson. Here. Padilla. Here. Nager. Here. Dobler. Here. Duncan. Here. And Lesser. Here. We have 10 present. Okay, we now move on to the appointments. A is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of Daryl Kaufman to the Board of Mechanical Examiners for a term ending December 31, 2021. B is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of James Daniel to the Topeka Metropolitan Transit Board for a term ending June 30, 2024. Appointment C, D, and E are board appointments recommending the reappointment of Nicola Nicholas Exodus, Ken Scott, and Stephen Smith to the Downtown Business Improvement District Advisory Board to fill a term ending June 30, 2022. We have heard the appointments. What is the pleasure of the body? Move approval. We have a motion for approval. Do we have a second? second. We have a second. We have a motion by Councilman Dobler. We have a second by Councilman Lesser. Questions or comments with regards to the approval? The mayor does not vote on these. Seeing none, we proceed by voting. Council members Hiller? Yes. Valdivia Aqua? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. Nager? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. And Lesser? Yes. We have nine yes. Nine having voting yes, the motion passes. Do, do we have any of the individuals that got signed up? Please, if you could please rise. Thank you for your commitment to our community and for your selfless service on our, on our boards. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you. 
We now move on to presentation. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight, um, I'd like to introduce Simon Martinez to the podium, and he will introduce our presenter. Simon. Good evening. My name is Simon Martinez, Treasury and Reporting Manager with the City of Topeka, and I'm here to introduce Kristen Hughes with RSM, who's going to give a presentation on the city's uh, results of the city's 2019 audit, as well as the uh, 2019 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Kristen? Hi, this is Kristen. Can everyone um, see and hear me okay? Okay. If you can bear with me one second, I'm going to share my screen and pull up the presentation. All right. Did that work okay? Did the PowerPoint come up? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for letting us join you this evening. I um, also have Stevie Reed. She's going to be listening. I, um, we're with RSM. This was our first year performing the city's audit. Um, I'm a senior manager with RSM and performed the, performed the partner review on the audit. And then Stevie Reed, she performed um, the manager review during the engagement as well. So as Simon mentioned, um, tonight we're going to go through and summarize um, a few items here in the PowerPoint that we went through with Simon and Jessica. Um, as he mentioned, the, you know, the audit is a really large process, both for the city finance department as well as us, as we go through and audit all the information. Um, as he mentioned, you've hopefully received a copy of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or the CAFR. Um, that is a large document. I think it's about 175 pages. So traditionally, in these types of settings, we, we don't go through that in great detail. It's a lot of information to try and go through in a meeting setting. Um, before I jump into the PowerPoint, though, I, I will just at a high level um, remind you what all what all is in that document, though, as you read through it. Um, you'll see uh, at the beginning of the of the CAFR, first of all, our audit opinion. Um, RSM and, and your independent auditor is going to issue an audit opinion, um, which is an unmodified or clean audit opinion. Unmodified is uh, the term used by the AICPA, but also referred to as a clean opinion, uh, meaning the financials are presented in accordance with GAAP. Also, at the beginning of the CAFR, um, I, I like to point people to what's referred to as management's discussion Excuse and analysis. Me. Um, this is a section that's been prepared by the finance department me. in more of a narrative form. So really, it goes through Kristen. in a handful of pages and summarizes. I'm sorry, someone's waving. Yes. Thank you. So because you are uh, participating virtually, sometimes the sound oh. sounds a little bit muffled. Would you be so kind to maybe speak a little bit slower and... That way we could take in everything that you're saying. I'm so sorry. Sure. Is that, and hopefully is that, can you hear me okay now? I, tur I turned it up a little bit better. Did that make it better or worse? Um, I think we're ready to try it out. Okay. And I'm, so I've got my phone right here in front of me, so I don't know that I can get much closer on my end is that does that sound better or it's it's not so much closer i think it's not it's a little bit slower in the pace okay we'll do we'll do <laughs> thank you for the wave and please feel free to do that i can see you if um if i'm going too fast so um just kind of where i was at uh management's discussion and analysis is what i was referring to in the catheter and I like to point people there uh, because it is, again, a, a narrative that management prepares uh, comparing the 2019 results to the 2018 and identifying any areas that might have had a significant change year over year. Moving into the financials themselves, as a reminder, the CAFR is going to include individual financial statements for all of the funds, um, governmental, business type, internal service funds that the city does have. So, Again, you, you can find individual financials presented for every fund you have, as well as that information is combined or consolidated um, into citywide total financial data. Behind the financials are what's referred to as the footnotes to the financials. A lot of detailed information on areas such as cash and investments, capital assets, debt the city has outstanding, pension plans you participate in, post-retirement uh, benefit plans that you offer to your retirees, um, as well as self-insurance plans. And then at the, at the back of the CAFR is an unaudited section. It's referred to as the statistical section. Some people find this uh, helpful. There's a lot of areas for revenue, revenue streams and debt that uh, present a 10-year history. So like I said, it's, it's more 
operational or on and on audited, but, but some people find that area informational because again, it's, it's 10 years worth of data. So just at a high level, that, that's kind of the content of the CAFR itself. Um, moving into the PowerPoint here, um, as I mentioned, we've gone through and just identified just a couple areas that we wanted to note. Um, so here, which you'll hopefully see on the slide in front of you, this is a summary of revenue in 2019 compared to 18 for all of the governmental funds combined. So this is going to be all of the governmental funds. So here you'll see that total governmental revenue in 2019 compared to the prior year went up about $3 million or 2%. And you look at the categories, um, most of that increase in 2019 was in both the tax revenue category as well as investment earnings. The market in, in 2019 performed much better than 18, so um, we saw a, a more positive result in the investment earnings area. The next slide here, um, similar, this is going to be total expenditures presented by the function or the service they support for all of the governmental funds combined. So in 2019, uh, you'll see there the total is about $204 million compared to about $172 million in the prior year. This was an increase of about $32 million or 19%. Um, a large portion of this, um, you'll see there in the purple category, uh, was debt service. So the city had completed um, some current refundings this year. So while debt service expenditures did increase this year, that was also funded um, because it was a refunding that was covered by the proceeds of the, of the new debt that was issued. Um, a couple other categories that saw increases this year were capital outlay for, for construction related type items as well as public works. Here on this slide, this is going to be specific to the general fund, which again is a reminder of the city's operating fund for the governmental funds. Um, fund balance is the terminology again for, the, for equity in the, fund, in the governmental funds. Um, and it can be presented in five different categories depending on what restrictions there may or may not be on those amounts. Um, restricted is when there's a, a third party restriction, committed is anything um, earmarked by, by the governing body or council, assigned is areas that management designates, and unassigned is items that are available for operating expenditures at discretion. So you'll see the majority of the balance in the general fund at year end uh, does fall in that unassigned category. Here on this slide, we've provided a summary of the operating results um, for the enterprise funds. So again, those are going to be the funds that are business type in nature, uh, proprietary or really function, almost like the private sector does. So this is going to include the city's water, storm water, water pollution, and parking funds all combined together. So here what we show is operating revenue in 2019 compared to the prior year. Um, you'll see revenue increased approximately two and a half million in the current year for operating results. Um, expenses in the current year compared to prior year from the operating side, those went up uh, closer to six million or nine percent, and that was that was fairly evenly distributed throughout the categories that are presented in the financials, which includes personnel costs, contractual service costs, supplies, and depreciation. The next chart, the next bar there shows depreciation. The only reason we highlight that and really it kind of leads into the fourth comparison, um, again, because these function on a net income basis and usually rates in these funds are determined based on whether or not um, operating costs are sufficiently covered. We do go ahead and pull out depreciation expense. Sometimes people find that more helpful just because while depreciation expense is a large operating cost, it's also a non-cash expenditure. Um, you know, again, as you're amortizing your capital assets, Yes, it's an operating cost, but it, it's not um, costing cash per se. And then that last comparison on the far right, um, because again, these financials for these funds are on a business type. These are the, the financials you do present a cash flow statement for. So here we've just shown again uh, the cash flows generated from operational costs. This slide here, um, at the conclusion of an audit, auditing standards um, have certain areas that auditors are required to communicate back to those charged with governance. So here we've provided a summary of those. As I mentioned, um, when I summarized the CAFR, we did issue an unmodified or clean opinion in the financial statements. Again, meaning they're presented in accordance with GAAP with no material deviation. We usually like to highlight as well if there was any new accounting standards implemented by the city this year that 
you may see a difference in either how something was accounted for in the current year financials compared to the prior year. There were a couple of new accounting standards. Um, GASB statement number 88 did not change how anything was accounted for. Uh, the GASB just required a few additional um, disclosures in your financials related to debt, and management has included those items um, in accordance with the standards. GASB statement number 89 um, actually eliminates capital interest. So previously in enterprise funds, um, as you paid interest on debt, if it was related to construction, you could capitalize those costs. Instead, the GASB now requires everyone to just simply expense those costs as incurred for all entities. And then the last item there, in light of everything going on with COVID, the GASB actually uh, released a new standard that allowed uh, entities to really defer the implementation date for all upcoming GASBs, just with everything else going on. Management judgments and accounting estimates. Um, this is just to let you know that as a part of the audit process, there are areas of the financials that involve estimates. They're a component of subjectivity, and then we do take a look at those as part of the audit. So examples would be um, estimates on the net pension liability, for example. So we do take a look at those as part of the audit make sure the assumptions used in the process are reasonable and that management is following city policies when doing those estimates and that they appear reasonable with industry standards. Uh, in the auditor communications, um, I believe that has been distributed by Simon and the Finance Department. We'll, we're also in that document, and I've, I've referred to the page there, you're provided a copy of any audit adjustments that come up during the audit process. Um, so those are just going to be adjustments that come up compared to the original trial balance received that have been reflected in the financial, in the final audited product. Uncorrected this statement, um, these represent material items. So again, items that may come up during the audit, but they're clearly immaterial to the financials. So management has the discretion to pass on those and, and we're in agreement that they're immaterial. So in these instances, um, small items that is said or just summarized in the letter versus reflected in the financials. If there was any disagreements or difficulties that came up during the audit, uh, we are required to communicate those to you. You'll just see here uh, that we noted there were none. Um, the GFOA submission, I did want to mention that. The city has historically submitted its CAPR uh, for the GFOA certification process. So in the CAPR, you will see the certificate that was received on last year's CAPR, and I'm sure Simon and his team will be submitting this year's as well. Um, good to mention, I mean, that's, that's not a requirement for public entities. Uh, it's really um, to receive the certificate. It's a really thorough checklist that does require additional information um, in the financials. So as the auditor, we like to point those out to those you know, the city council just to know that you know in those scenarios, finance department has gone above and beyond as far as what's required in the financial um, report to achieve that certificate. Lastly, um, as part of our audit, there were two significant deficiencies um, that we reported in what you'll see noted as the compliance report. Um, these are both on the financial reporting side. One, with the audit adjustments that I previously mentioned, auditing standards just require us to evaluate uh, the nature of the adjustments, how material were they, uh, what would the impact have been if those had not been reported in the financials. Um, so, you know, the, in the grand scheme of what pulls together in the financials, the city records a lot of closing entries. Um, so it's not uncommon for four, four items to come up during the audit. And like I said, the standards require us to evaluate those. Um, so there were a couple items that were significant, so we've just communicated a significant deficiency on that process and, and discussed that with the finance department. And then lastly, there was um, the city includes uh, what's called a discreetly presented component unit presentation, um, specifically for the Friends of the Zoo. Those financials are pulled into the city's capper uh, because of that, that relationship with that entity. Um, and there was a material error just identified in the prior year financials. So the current year was restated to, to correct that. So we also noted an efficiency um, related to that, but management has corrected that in the final audit product. I'm gonna stop there. That was really um, the items that I intended to go through, uh, both as far as the audit and the financials, but I'm happy to go through any, any questions you might have. Questions uh, for our auditors? Councilman Dobler. Yeah, just a couple. Uh, Significant deficiencies, where does that rank in the list of, of uh, internal control issues? Uh, good question. So as far as uh, the deficiency rankings, um, 
When matters come up, there's really three rankings, if, if you want to call that, that might occur. It's uh, material weakness is the, um, I would say, largest deficiency category. So there's the material weakness, and then there's significant deficiency, and then there's a control deficiency. Um, so these, these were determined to be significant because of the dollar amount, but were not considered a material weakness in the overall financial reporting process. Question. Okay. One more. Thank you. Um, do you do a lot of, of uh, audits for municipalities? I, I do. Um, our, our firm as a whole, we, we do a lot of, uh, we refer to the public sector as um, both our government and our nonprofit practice. Um, personally, both Stevie and I, we work, I probably spend 85% of my year working on public sector clients. Um, I do primarily cities, counties, public utilities, and school districts. Um, so yes, as our firm as a whole, we, we certainly have a large um, government practice. Great. Where, where would you rank the city of Topeka uh, versus the other municipalities that you audit, just in general terms? Ranked by? Uh, as far as, as financial stability and, uh, you know, the job that the, the financial folks here at the city do compared to the, the other cities. Is it average? Is it good? Is it very good? Where, where would you rank it? Yeah, that's kind of hard. I mean, you know, the purpose of an audit is um, the purpose of an financial statement audit is to uh, give an opinion on whether the financial financial statements are presented in accordance with GAAP. Um, we have, like I said, as part of the audit process. I mean, if we have any deficiencies that come up, I mean, we've communicated those to you. As far as I mean, ranking of the city compared to others. Um, you know, first off, I, again, I would point to the audit opinion. A clean opinion is a, a strong indicator of the financials you're presenting and the process that went put, that was in the process that went into putting that together. Um, yes, two significant deficiencies came up. Um, we've discussed those with the finance department. I I have other clients that receive deficiencies as well. I have clients that receive material weaknesses. I have some without deficiencies. So, you know, we see different results on that. Um, Financial stability, I think you also asked about, we, we really honestly can't weigh in on that. I mean, we actually, as an audit firm, you know, we, we can't really look forward um, as far as an entity's financial stability, um, but we, you know, we report on the accuracy of the financial data that is being prepared. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, good, good dancing. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't see any from our folks on Zoom and no other questions from the team. All right, thank you very much. At this point in time, we move on to the consent agenda. Oh, I apologize, I have a question for, oh, for yeah. staff. I didn't of have course. a question for her, so Can you just go through internally what you do with these audits once you receive them and what the process is for you and staff and do you see deficiencies and correction process for that? I can let Jessica answer in more specific, no, Sorry. But, um, as far as what we do with this information, uh, primarily it is the staff takes this information and looks at how we've been doing our reporting and how we've been doing our tracking of information to make sure that any, the, the real purpose is, is if it's identified in the audit as a mistake or a deficiency, we want to make sure that as we go into next year, it's not repeat. That is the important, most important thing is if it's identified as a deficiency that needs to be fixed in some way. We determine a solution so that next time around it's it's fixed. Simon, you have something to add? Yeah. Something the client support that you guys receive as well at the back of the board here, but how do we have to address the weaknesses or anything that they, they found and then address a plan as well to to go along with those weaknesses in the in the back of that. You'll see the, the plan that we addressed uh, to identify with those deficiencies. So thank you. Thank you. Other questions from staff? I mean to staff. Seeing none, thank you for the presentation. We move on to the consent agenda, if the clerk would read. A is an ordinance introduced by City Manager Brent Trout, allowing and approving city expenditures for the period of February 29 through March 27, 2020, and enumerating expenditures therein. B is a resolution introduced by Council Member Karen Hiller, approving a special event known as the Jazz and Food Truck Festival. C is a resolution introduced by Council Member Karen Hiller, approving a special event known as the Second Saturday Summer Concert Series. 
B is a resolution introduced by Karen Hiller granting Greater Topeka Partnership an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seat concerning noise prohibitions. E is a resolution introduced by Councilmember Karen Hiller granting the Celtic Fox an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seat concerning noise prohibitions. F is a resolution introduced by Councilmember Sylvia Ortiz granting Alexandria Hegarty an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seat concerning noise prohibitions. C are minutes of the regular meeting of June 9, 2020, and there is a list of applications for cereal malt beverage, dance hall, and open after midnight, and staff is recommending approval. We have heard the consent agenda. What is the pleasure of the body? Move approval. We have a motion for approval by Councilman oh. Dobler. We have second. a second by Mr. Padilla, uh, Councilman Padilla. <clears throat> Comments or questions on the consent agenda? Seeing none, we proceed by voting. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Council Member Siller? Yes. Valdivia Acla? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. Nager? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Maybe. Yes. And Lesser? Yes. We have 10 yes. 10 having voting yes, the motion passes. We now move on to the action items. Item A of the clerk would read. A is a resolution of the City of Topeka, Kansas, determining the advisability of issuing revenue bonds to provide funds to finance, refinance, and reimburse the cost of facilities for Midland Care Connection, Inc. and its affiliates. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> um, the Industrial Revenue Bond Committee met today and went through the, uh, listened to the presentation related to the, from the Bond Council for this particular project and after deliberation agreed to approve moving forward with the application. Um, we have on Zoom uh, uh, Karen Weichart and also Bond Council Kevin Cowan so that if there are questions before the, uh, uh, for them, they are available to answer them. The project basically entails the selling of industrial revenue bonds for work that they have completed and are planning to complete with, with some, also some refinancing um, the project will allow them to do some expansions with their um, one of their existing buildings as well. So I guess to answer any questions that are available. Are there any questions for Ms. Weikert or for our bond council? Seeing no questions, what is the pleasure of the body? Motion approved. We have a motion for approval. This is uh, in Councilman Lesser's district. Um, do we have a second? We have a second by Councilman Dobler. Comments or questions again? We have Ms. Weikert here. We have our bond council. Seeing no questions, we proceed by voting. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Council members Hiller? Yes. Valdivia Acla? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. Nager? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. And Lesser? Yes. We have 10 yes. 10 having voting yes, the motion passes. Ms. Weikert, would, is there anything that you would like to tell the body? Um, just thank you very much. We appreciate that and we appreciate your belief in our organization to support us in this way. So thank you very much. Thank you for your service to our community. Thank you. Okay, we now move on to the non-action items. Action A, uh, action item, non-action item A, if the clerk would read. A is an update on the City of Topeka 2020 operating budget. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, there isn't much to report tonight. Um, we have the, the larger report that was provided by Jessica at the last meeting. Um, since then, there really hasn't been much in the new numbers. The only thing that was encouraging was the announcement that May spending nationwide was up considerably in May, uh, more than those, uh, I guess, the experts were expecting. Um, we'll see, obviously, what our final numbers end up becoming, uh, but uh, that is encouraging. It's better than the other type of news you might receive regarding the, the uh, consumer spending. So we, will sh we shall see. Um, we're making very good progress related to the pulling of the 2021 budget together and still moving forward towards providing you the, the budget book, the large document on the 19th, and all of the meetings, uh, the individual meetings or group meetings, the so small group meetings are scheduled. 
Um, if you have any conflict as we get closer to that, please let us know and we can look to reschedule. But uh, that's the information that I have tonight, Mayor. Any other questions for city manager, comments? Okay, seeing none. We then move on. Oh, Mr. Ledbetter. Did you have comments on the budget? Even governing body, uh, <clears throat> I haven't been here in a while, as you know, and uh, but I have such emails, and I hope you've gotten to read some of them, and. <laughs> I know, I know Neil always looks for it. What a, yeah, you didn't see any, right, okay. Well, they did go into the record, so <laughs> the clerk will have them for you. Uh, Your words. Yeah, my, well, I'm not even saying that tonight, but yeah, I usually do. Uh, one thing I uh, want to emphasize, and I've, I've said this in my emails, but I'm saying it publicly, uh, I very much support a very strong police department. Uh, most of the people in this town are really happy with our police department, and uh, that includes business people. That includes people in Highcrest uh, that I served for five years. Uh, I know that uh, five years ago, this July, uh, the police helped us stop a gang war over there uh, where a little child was killed, and then it, it escalated dramatically. And uh, <clears throat> without... Uh, a very strong presence of the police and that thin blue line that protects us from that anarchy, uh, Highcrest uh, could have gone up in smoke. It was really that close. And uh, of course it hasn't, and it's uh, uh, done remarkable recovery over there. Uh, the gangs aren't even over there anymore. So uh, I don't know where they went and I don't care, uh, but they left. Uh, and uh, so it doesn't mean that crime doesn't exist over there, but they did stop those gangs from uh, coming back. And so we appreciate the police, <clears throat> and, uh, and I appreciate the police, even though I don't live there and I don't serve them anymore as their president. Uh, I know uh, that uh, the people depend on our police to have stability and not anarchy. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, we've got the, the possibilities of, of trimming staff. Uh, it's time during this... Uh, opportunity as we'll call it this crisis to uh, to look at uh, where staff may need to go as far as uh, trimming of staff uh, I note that in I tried to send this I don't know if you got it um, I got the research in 2020 uh, the city has 1194 and a half FTEs in 2012 after we uh, transferred the parks and rec which I supported to the county we had 1198 the only uh, trimming that's been done over these years that I can tell was looking at the zoo budget. They, they trimmed, I think, three staff, uh, which was a pretty good number for them, which I think they only had 25 people total. Um, I would never trim the, the police or fire at this point, but I do think we need to look at fleet services. I think we need to look at forestry. We've got a number of private sector companies that... Uh, uh, provide uh, tree services. Uh, I know the Parks and Rec uses them. I'm on that advisory. I know the Parks and Rec has over half of its park, which is 2,000 some acres, that are mowed by private contractors. So this is not a new concept to use private contractors to uh, do mowing or uh, tree service and uh, to do street repairs. I, I think it's time to seriously look at that uh, and see if uh, the private sector can uh, compete against our, uh, our own workers and maybe do a better job. And one thing about the private sector uh, is they have to stand behind the repairs. So if uh, they make a repair and it doesn't hold up in that year with their contract, uh, you just call them and tell them, come fix it, or you don't get another contract. And uh, that's, that's a very powerful incentive for the private sector to do things right the first time and not have to keep coming back. I guess I'm out of time. Could I have two more minutes, please? I'm looking at you, Tony. I don't care. 
Do we have? <laughs> we have deputy that? mayor making a motion for an additional two minutes. Do we have a second? Yeah. We have a second. It's uh, up to you. Now, at this point in time, we all proceed by voting. Mayor Daly Isla? Yes. Council members Hiller? Yes. Valdivia Acala? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Yes. Padilla? Yes. Nager? Yes. I'm here now. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. And Lesser? Yes. We have 10 yes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, one of the, the entities that has uh, kind of surfaced to me as, as a entity of the city that probably needs a little more uh, uh, scrutiny and oversight by this board of directors is uh, the way we handle stormwater uh, projects. <coughs> and so I, I think the, the whole utilities uh, is an interesting problem uh, since we continue to escalate and escalate and escalate the water rates. Uh, to me, good government first looks at how to control cost, how to uh, get operational costs under control before you ask for more money of the citizens and the businesses, especially in this kind of uh, climate. So uh, what I'd like to see in next year's budget is more and more uh, outsourcing of uh, the repairs, uh, look at uh, taking some of those uh, excess reserves and actually replacing uh, a lot of lines of uh, the distribution that has so many breaks in it. And I don't have time to go into those details, but I have talked about this before uh, at rate increase hearings and other things where you could actually cut your cost if you take some of those reserves and actually uh, complete blocks and blocks of uh, uh, line replacement instead of just going back and patching it year after year. And uh, I think the minimum uh, one of those repairs costs is over $2,500. That's a minimum. Uh, a lot of them are a lot more expensive than that. So uh, I appreciate your attention and thank you for this time. And uh, I've missed y'all. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you for your comments. At this point in time, um, we move on to the public comment. Um, Mr. Ledbetter, you were the first person signed up for additional public comment. I'm going to wave. I just pretty much said what I needed to about the police, so I, I think I've already covered that. Thank you. Next person signed up to speak is Laura Pedrezani. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Laura Petterzani, resident of District 2. I'm coming to you as a young resident, a homeowner, and a taxpayer to bring to light growing concerns I've had across many departments of the city. I hope you all receive the port resporting documents to my public comments. I do not want to waste anyone's time simply reading these emails to you, so instead I would like to sum up my concern with one simple point. The city is absolutely failing across multiple departments when it comes to providing prompt, efficient service to constituents. In 2017, my neighborhood began suffering many code enforcement violations. I did the only thing I knew to do and started reporting these violations and notifying our community officer of crime issues in the area. Three years have passed and our neighborhood is worse than it was in 2017. The same problems are happening with the same properties, and it feels like even the city thinks that salvaging what is left of our neighborhood is a lost cause. I've included photographs for you, which show the condition of my block, just two houses from me. I've been asked if I lived by a junkyard, and I've been told that friends don't feel safe coming to my house because of the condition of my neighborhood. I've reached out to code, to zoning, to TPD, and been told we're doing what we can. One TPD officer even said, well, it's North Topeka, what did you expect? After I let my anger subside, I asked myself the same question. What did I expect? I expected the city to help residents take proactive action to prevent blight and the degradation of neighborhoods. I expected that city employees would return emails and phone calls in a timely manner. I expected to not be fed excuse after excuse as to why department after department couldn't do anything to help us. 
I expected that a police department would remember the second half of their mission statement, faithfully serve our citizens with impeccable integrity, enduring professionalism, and immeasurable honor. I expected the smallest bit of courtesy from literally anyone. As a city and county, we invest money into cash incentives to bring new residents and workers here, and yet we fail to provide basic services to residents that already live here. We tout cleverly named projects and rejuvenation, and yet we allow existing neighborhoods to sink into conditions beyond repair. We title Noto, where I live, a charming, affordable neighborhood, subtitle Hip Homesteaders. And yet those of us who live there can't expect to be assisted by city employees. I have, in my neighborhood, there is a property that has been let sit with unpaid taxes and fees for eight years without taking any action, even after I expressed an interest in purchasing the lot just as a way to take ownership of the, product, of the problem myself, and basically being told, even after the fact, um, that they couldn't do anything because it was abandoned. So we have yet another property sitting with salvage vehicles on it, visible from the roadway for more than a year, in direct violation of land use requirements passed by this very governing body. And then we ask ourselves why no one wants to live in Topeka. I believe in making Topeka better for everyone, but the city has to do better. We have to do better together to provide better customer service to all the constituents. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Councilwoman Valdivia. Valdivia Alcala. Laura, thank you for coming up. Um, I hope that we can continue to work together. I think it took a lot of bravery for you to come up here. As a young person in North Topeka, uh, starting to get involved in the NIA uh, over in, in that area, I think it's very commendable. I think it's commendable of the elder neighbors that you watch over. I think it's commendable the way you and your husband are so absolutely concerned uh, uh, about the condition of the neighborhood and my goal is co to continue to work with you and if that means that we need to push more I apologize for some of those emails that you receive because those are not customer service friendly emails in my opinion having been trained in customer service for like a hundred years but we we I will work with you until the sun goes down so I really appreciate you taking the time to do this because I know you're busy. I appreciate that. May, may I respond? May I respond? Typically it's not permitted okay. um, because it's public comment, but I don't, I don't want to censor you. Um, it's, okay. that's, I'm just looking at the body <laughs> to make sure that there's consensus that it's okay. If you could please be prompt in your response. Yes. Thank you. The only thing I have to say is that the only reason any progress has been made is because I looped a city council member in on the issue. If it would have just been me and our neighbors, my emails would have still gone unanswered. They still would not have returned my phone calls. And what little progress has been made wouldn't have been made without getting a city council member involved. That's not empowering your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Melissa. I, I too wanted to applaud you for coming up here. Um, I thought you were very articulate. I thought you made your points uh, and were, were very well spoken without uh, crossing the line of, of, of being hateful. Um, and I appreciate that. I appreciate your passion as a former North Topekan. Um, and uh, if Councilwoman Valdivia needs any assistance, I, I'm happy to help her out on, on that as well because uh, um, it's not acceptable. Period. Thank you. Thank you. Next person signed up to speak is Oshara Hayes. Good evening. My name is Oshara Hayes and I am a citizen of Tito Course. I live on the east side in District 3. And I've not been before the council a lot, and I'm going to make that different now. 
And um, I just want to mention a couple of things. I was able to look at the uh, meeting that you all had on June 2nd. And I saw some things that as a citizen that I was really surprised at. And I would just want to count, um, speak to that. First, I want to define some things and make sure I have the correct understanding is that the council is the parliamentary or congressional style legislative body. They propose bills and hold votes and passing laws to help govern the city. And the city manager is responsible for ensuring the effective implementation, administration, and evaluation of city programs through the policy directives of the governing body serves as a resource for citizens. Um, I, I noticed some things that are meeting, well, at that meeting, that it felt different for me because it felt like, it felt like the city manager was taking on decisions when comments were coming from the council. And I just want to make sure that when, when all the, when the council members speak, when they speak to someone individually, that's them speaking. But when the city council members are here in this chamber having public comment, they're speaking for the people that voted for them. And they're speaking for people that go to the poll and, and, and exercise their right to vote. And I think it's very important that the city manager remember that that's the purpose of us coming here. And that's why we're able to have, you know, be able to come here and have public comment. And I just want to make sure that when you do speak to the city council when you're talking and the city council member is saying, this is what I think should be done, or this is, they're not speaking for themselves. They're speaking for me, and they're speaking for other people that are here um, in the chamber. So speaking for people who are watching. And I just want to clarify that and make sure that you remember that when they speak, they're speaking for the people. And that's what I want to say. Anything else, Ashara? I'm sorry, what? Anything else, Oshara? No, that's what, I, that's what I needed to say. Okay, well, thank you for your comments. All right, thank you. At this point in time, uh, we don't have anybody else signed up to speak in public comment. Um, I do, uh, we do have announcements, and we start with the city clerk. City manager. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. Well, the first thing is, is I'll follow up with Ms. Pedrozrini about her issues and obviously get to the bottom of what's going on there, take care of that. Um, Secondly, of course, I've never forgot that I that you represent the citizens of this community and that that's the voice that you have. So fully realize that. Um, as far as a couple of good things, I, we do have a new program. I'm excited to announce the Topeka Rescue Mission, working in conjunction with the city of Topeka, organizations, churches, businesses, and many volunteers, will begin developing a systematic approach to identify gaps in our food delivery system and work together to assist individuals and families in our neighborhoods. Operation Food Secure is underway with the opportunity to not only provide food security to many vulnerable citizens within our community, but also has the potential to enhance neighbors helping neighbors. So we are beginning the process working with the rescue mission. Um, they, have, uh, they are working on securing some funding that will allow them to have food distributions within the neighborhoods and the NIAs and so we're excited about that. They are looking for individuals to be captains and co-captains in the areas where the weekly distribution of food will occur in 2020. If you're interested, you can call Monique Guade at 785-368-4470. If you didn't get the number down, just call the city and we'll get you in touch with Monique. Um, they're working on uh, the distribution system will involve the neighborhoods. And so it's a pretty neat program. And uh, I set in on their first kickoff meeting to, to find the interest, and it's definitely there. Um, the second thing I want to cover is we will not meet again prior to July 4th, so I want to remind everybody of our rules related to the uh, firing of consumer fireworks. Consumer fireworks may only be discharged within the city between the hours of 10 a.m. and 11 p.m. on July 3rd of each year, and between the hours of 10 a.m and 11.59 p.m. on July 4th of each year. Discharge on any other date or time is unlawful. Um, reminder that fireworks should not be discharged within 
500 feet of the VA hospital uh, medical center on 2200 Southwest Gage, and no person shall sell, excuse me, sell or offer for sale any consumer fireworks in the city unless the person has obtained a permit from the city clerk. So make sure you don't, aren't selling without having got a permit. Also, the final thing is, is that adult supervision is required. Persons under the age of 18 must be under adult supervision when they're shooting fireworks or in the physical presence of the adult in order to possess and discharge those fireworks. So anyway, just one of the simple reminders of some of our rules and I uh, hope everybody has a safe 4th of July. Thank you, City Manager. Um, this week, we're going to have a whole bunch of celebrations of Juneteenth. Um, for those of you that don't know, 1862 um, Emancipation Proclamation uh, was passed. However, in Texas, they decided that they did not want to abide by that, and it was in 1865 on June 19th that finally uh, those slaves that were still uh, being held were finally finding their freedom. Um, that's a huge celebration in the black community, and I want to make sure that for those of you who are interested in participating in any of the Juneteenth events, there's going to be one engaged park with Manny Heron uh, Friday. Uh, there's going to be one on Saturday at the steps of the Capitol that Chris Weir is putting together. And then there's another one that's going to be put together, um, a caravan that's going to be going down, I think, from the Capitol over to the Brown v. Board site as well. So if you want to learn about this beautiful celebration of freedom, please, please, please check out um, a lot of the events that are going to be happening in the community and just go and learn. Ask questions and learn. Um, it's going to be a great time in our community. Um, and for those of you who are going to be with us at 8, uh, we have a Topeka High student that decided that she wanted to stand up for what she believes in. And um, there's going to be several of us that are going to go over there and walk with her from the steps of the Capitol at 8 o'clock. And we're going to go over to the Brown v. Board site. So you are all invited. At this point, we go to Councilman Dobler. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, really, the only comment I have tonight is to uh, thank Father Schiffelbein, Father Matthew, for his uh, words of wisdom tonight. And I'd like to uh, thank the other two pastors that uh, participated this month. Uh, I appreciate the time it takes, again, to come down and, and spend a few minutes with, it, with us. Thank you. Before I recognize Councilman Duncan, I wanted to acknowledge before I passed on that we have several members of the Black Lives Matters group here for people that are at home and are not able to see. Thank you for being here this evening. Councilman uh, Duncan. Good evening. Uh, just three things. First is, I um, thought on Sunday, heading into Sunday, our, our hometown boy Gary Woodland was going to do something. He had a little struggle at the end, but he finished in top ten, so good for Gary. There, you know, At least he's still representing Topeka proudly. and. And he does it very well. Uh, my second thing is, obviously, with all that's going on, partially just it's summer, other issues, we forget that some of us that COVID-19 is still there, and it's still real, and it's still something we've got to deal with. And parts of the state have seen significant spikes. Um, so I just remind people, stay vigilant, do the little things. I know some of them are, quote, unquote, annoying. But so be it. If it gets us through this uh, from not having a, a surge as we head into the fall, uh, that, that's important. Uh, my last thing is we've now spent several weeks listening to people, as we will tonight, as we watch a high school student try to get our attention. And one of the com several of the conversations I've had is people said, well, you got to go vote. You got to go vote because you got to change the people at the top so that they can put policies in place because the people who are there aren't listening. And I've tried, as I've promised, and I've listened very hard the last several weeks, but listening's only half the battle. Listening's great and it's essential. But what do you do after you're done listening? You've got to take some action and some steps to show people that you're paying attention and that what matters to them matters to you to make our community better. With that in mind, as I notified the council last week and I've talked with staff as they're putting it together, I have asked this council to consider an ordinance that would ban no-knock warrants. I'm also going to ask this council to what seems to be universal, even signed by the president today, look at our chokehold policy. I want to be very clear on both of those. Under our current chief and under our current officer leadership, both those policies are essentially not the policy. We don't train under chokeholds. We don't use them. We primarily do not use no-knock warranties. And I'm very appreciative of that. And I think that means a lot. As I always say, though, our job here is to look out for the institution. We won't have the same police chief forever. We won't have the same officer leadership forever. And it's our job 
to make sure that the things that are good policy today might as well be good law for tomorrow. And so I will ask this body to look at those things, and I hope we can look at a few other things to show people that we're serious about making some changes and, and working together as a group to, to see those changes follow through. So thank you very much. Councilman Lesser. Councilwoman Hiller. I'll just uh, chime in as well about my appreciation for all of the efforts that are the communication as well as the action community-wide about diversity and inclusion, equity, and, and welcome to all members of the community. It, um, people have handled it so well. I'm really thrilled to see the young people stepping up and taking the lead. Um, I certainly I, I see other things starting to schedule out. and. Um, as we've discussed before, I want to see us as leaders as well as a body of the council, but also brought more broadly in the community. I want to see this community take steps forward to be better than we were when this started. And I think that we can. I think the commitment is there. So challenge all of us to look at ways that we can do that. Um, everything from committing to a common um, statement of commitment about diversity and inclusion, as well as taking actions to look um, within the different activities or sectors of this city. Are they diverse? Are they inclusive? Are there some things that we need to do? We'll need to engage everyone on that because there are a lot of places to look and a lot of, lot of, lot of sectors to evaluate how we doing and what could we do to make this better. Again, I hope to see within the next couple of months that we, we actually put together a total community-wide initiative. And with that, um, look forward to the upcoming events and everybody have a safe 4th of July. Lots of fun with family and friends. Once again, distancing if, uh, if there's strangers involved. Thank you. Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the city manager, I would like to see if we can get onto the agenda as soon as possible, uh, three different items. And I really hope that we don't use the veil of, ex uh, of executive session uh, to discuss these because I, I'm hoping that we're going to hear that all of these, these three items I'm asking for are something that can take place in a public forum. Uh, I would like to uh, see about getting a report on the role and the results of the independent police auditor. Also, I would like to get a presentation by the chief or liaison of the chief specifically on the use of force policy or policies. Um, also, I would like to get an update by the securing police community partnerships uh, to I'm anxious to hear from them to see uh, what kind of metrics they had and if they've been met, et cetera. And also, I would like to get something on the agenda to start discussions on a citizen review panel to work hand in hand with the IPA on police complaints. Um, I want to talk about hard dialogue. That seems to be a buzzword that's going around. Let's have the hard dialogue. So here's um, a bit of hard dialogue right now. I represent District 2. And last Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, um, people came into, or perhaps they were from District 2. We don't know because I haven't heard anything. And they did not your traditional graffiti. They did extremist, racist, alt-right, fascist graffiti. They used words I had to look up on Google because I did not know what they meant or what the acronyms stood for. They used the N word. They used the F word towards BLM. They went on to say Blue Lives Matter, stay out of Oakland, on and on and on. I saw this early uh, Wednesday morning, and I want to give really big thanks to Commissioner Cook because they handled the Parks and Rec, and he was on it immediately to get it off.
then it was like the world went dead. I mean, we saw it in the media, but as a body, there was no gestures to come into this community that has been wounded because you should have seen the, oh, the comments on the Oakland page. Some of them you'd be kind of worried, but most of them were so deeply, deeply saddened at what had happened to their community and wanted answers. I was hard pressed to find those, but I do believe with Commissioner Cook's help, We'll be able to, I'll be able to stay more informed. And I just want to tell District 2 people that we are looking at doing an art project and we want people from Oakland to take the lead because there is a long and deep history of brown folks, black folks, white folks in that community. And we want to help make it right. And so I'm very, to me, that is hate dialogue, but I haven't heard anything else about it. So we want to talk the hard dialogue. I called the KBI today because I was so worried about what I heard or what I read on the Topeka scanner. When there was a young teenager with several boys that had been drinking and were holding weapons and were threatening bodily harm to black folks. I considered that very terrifying as an elected official as a mother, as a grandmother. I could not get the answers. I felt that as an elected official, I should be able to get from the chief, so I called the KBI. Within a number of hours, I had a response from them. We identified the individual as far as where he went to school. They, he made amends. Uh, it did not rise to the level of domestic terrorist threat because of freedom of speech issues. So what I'm saying is this is the hard dialogue. And we need to have this hard dialogue, in my opinion, in this body. But all there has been, whether you all know it or not, from what I can tell, is a lot of silence. So thank you. Councilwoman Ortiz. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, the Juneteenth that you were looking for is going to be at 1 o'clock on June the 19th, Saturday, at Betty Phillips Park. Um, that's that's the third one that you were looking for, I believe. There's actually um, four. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, hope everyone has a great Juneteenth celebration as well, as well as uh, July 4th coming up. And uh, on, a, on a personal note, I don't usually do this, but since they're right behind me, I just wanted to thank, or just wanted to congratulate my daughter, Sydney. She's been working on a huge thing for nursing school. She has finally got a pass today. And uh, and Jeremiah here now has his, learner's, his driver's permit, so watch out on the streets. <laughs> thank you. Councilman Padilla. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple of things. I want to thank the Topeka Police Department and their training division for giving me an opportunity to go and sit in on their training for fair and impartial train, uh, policing. I also got to listen to Kane Davis in his presentation with regards to diversity and bias-based policing. I think that was very informative. I appreciate the fact that uh, Councilwoman Hiller showed up uh, and for some of the presentation. I think it's important that uh, we learn firsthand the kind of training that uh, our officers are receiving and uh, get it straight from them. Um, I want to tell you that my admonition to the recruits in that room was that reform is necessary but reform doesn't mean that they're left out of the process in bringing that form reform about. I think for any lasting and meaningful reforms, the police have to be directly involved. Forced reform is be something that just pushes things under the blanket and into the shadows. So there has to be an accepted process by all who are affected. 
I encourage them as young officers to be the best they can, to remember that their purpose is to protect and serve, the service being the primary responsibility, and that they need to get involved with their community outside of their regular duties as a law enforcement officer, get involved with some of our nonprofit organizations, speak directly if necessary uh, with uh, council members to talk about their concerns and what ideas they have that they know uh, from the inside as well that can be used to help us improve what we already do now. So I appreciate that opportunity and I would encourage all council members when they have that opportunity to visit with uh, the chief or some of his training staff to visit with them or Mr. Davis about the information that he shares with them during recruit training. Uh, I uh, also want to remind everybody that like uh, the COVID-19, the other thing that was going on before uh, we were interrupted by this pandemic was the census. And the census continues to be a priority for us. Kansas is doing okay, but can do much better. And in fact, this weekend, there is a concerted effort to bring Kansas up higher into the rankings. And so please, for those people who have not taken the time yet to spend about six to eight minutes filling out that census, get, make sure that you've done it, make sure your family has done it, make sure your friends have done it. We need that information for those people who wanna talk about reforms and getting more money to help us get the things we need in this community. The census count is critical to that so that we can have those funds available to us. So please do everything you can to promote this participation in the census, particularly this weekend. Thank you, I hope you all have a great holidays. Be safe, take care. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Council. Mike Pavida. Um, sure. Don't forget, Mike, I was there too at that training. Oh, that's right, I forgot. Well, you had that mask on. I couldn't yeah, remember. I know. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Councilwoman Nager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I want to wish everybody a very happy Pride. Um, this is the month that we, across the nation, recognize um, the people in our community who identify as LBGTQ+, um, and a very important ruling was made yesterday by the Supreme Court of the United States that protects those rights of people who identify as LBGTQ. Sorry, trying to make sure that I have all the letters in there. Um, that they have the right to work and be who they are. And that's so important to our communities that have been ostracized in the past. And I'm very appreciative of having that support from the federal level. The Human Relations Commission of Topeka, Kansas has been working on a non-discrimination ordinance. And this is one of the cornerstones of that ordinance, is making sure that we're protecting our LGBTQ community in housing and hiring and making sure that we are protecting them from hate crimes. So this is something that will be coming um, before the council. I'm working with um, our legal department at the city level and hope to get that before the council at the, before the end of the summer. Um, so happy Pride. Also, happy Juneteenth. Be careful whenever you go out, whether you're demonstrating for Black Lives Matter or you are supporting our Black brothers and sisters on this day of freedom and celebration. Make sure that you are adhering to COVID standards of keeping your celebrations to acceptable levels and making sure that people are equipped with hand sanitizer, masks, and staying a proper distance from each other. Um, we want to make sure that with all of this celebration of Black lives at this time, that we're making sure that this is not just a moment, that it's a movement. And I'm very excited by the responses that I've been getting through my city council um, correspondence, through my personal correspondence, and I'm excited to coordinate those efforts with other city council members in the mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Being no other further items on our agenda, 
This meeting is adjourned.